Blessed be the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Please be seated. The Gospel of Mark was written about 40 years after the conclusion of Jesus' public ministry. At that time, some important events were occurring, and probably the most important was that in August of the year 70, following months of insurrection, the city of Jerusalem was besieged and captured by a Roman army led by Titus, who would later become emperor. Over 21 days, they breached and entered and sacked the city. Jewish forces had been the first to use fire to fight back. They burned the path to stop the Roman advance. The Romans countered by setting an apartment ablaze, and it was adjacent to the temple. A writer named Josephus was a contemporary of those times. He said that a soldier snatched some of the materials that were on fire and being lifted up by another soldier, he set fire to a golden window through which there was passage to the rooms that were round about the holy house. Josephus wrote that as the flames went upward, the Jews made a great clamor, such as so mighty an affliction required and ran together to prevent it and now they spared not their lives any longer, nor suffered anything to restrain their force, since that holy house was perishing. Thus it was the holy house burnt down. He wrote, no one can imagine anything greater or more terrible than this noise. For there was at once a shout of the Roman legions who were marching all together and a sad clamor of the seditious who were now surrounded with fire and sword. The people under a great consternation made sad moans at the calamity they were under. Yet was the misery itself more terrible than the disorder. For one would have thought that the hill itself on which the temple stood was seething hot as full of fire on every part of it. The temple was torn apart, stone by stone. You can walk the temple mount today and see them, the stones, lying in some cases as they landed the day Roman soldiers pried them out and let them fall. In this way, the second temple met its demise on the same day of the calendar that the first temple had met its demise six centuries prior by the Neo-Babylonians. But that last incarnation until it was pulled down by Roman soldiers, it had stood fast for five centuries as a site of worship and sacrifice it was thought to be the primary means of communication between God and humanity. And now it was gone, provoking a crisis of faith, and that had to be reckoned with. So what would you do if the way that you worship God were taken away from you? We like to think we are robust and flexible in the face of disaster, and that's true. But I think some of you who've been around here for a while might have a little more nuanced answer than that. It was not, after all, insurrection or some uprising against the state that started the fire in this sacred place on November 26, 1975. Nevertheless, the next day's newspaper hinted that the same prayer of lament had floated up with the smoke overnight. The moaning and the calamity at the sight of a temple temporarily turned to seething hot. Dean Olson was quoted on the front page of the next morning's paper at the time it was called the Topeka State Journal. He said, the first thing we have to do is stop crying, I guess start getting it cleaned up as much as we can so we can start rebuilding. 
31 years later in 2006 over at St. David's Episcopal Church on Gage, that similar keening of sadness and lament where the temple was suddenly aflame. The work of a teenage arsonist. When the smoke cleared, the church building was judged unsound to stand. The bulldozers moved in and sadly not one stone remained on another. But this is never the end of the story. We are Easter people. Christians are Easter people. And as sure as the sunrise, resurrection comes after death. So we grieve, and then we look some more after we grieve. And each one of these stories has something valuable to teach us. It talks about a period of tears and tumult and disruption, yes, followed by years of sweat and hope. The answer came for the Jewish people, write the law on your hearts and practice it. Focus in a little more on the local synagogue. Dream of another temple at some point. And the answer came for the Episcopalians of Topeka. Beams could be raised and laid once again and the people of God could enter in once more to perfect their praise in the sanctuary. Sometimes to see the glory of God, it just helps to think about brick and mortar. Sometimes to see the word of Christ at work in the world, you have to sift through what's left so you can build it again, maybe even better this time. Sometimes to see how the Holy Spirit stirs the pot, you have to live with cinders and ash and fallen rocks until God grants the new vision. Look at these very stones surrounding us this morning. And see the writer of the Gospel of Mark walking through, well, whatever was left of Jerusalem. Some smoke still rising close by, legions of soldiers leading captives away, and the stark yellow light of morning coming through. See that writer looking down at those fallen stones of the house of God. Hear his lament as he casts his vision heavenward and prays the same two questions that we always ask any time tragedy comes to us. Why did this have to happen? And what do we do now? And now look again and listen a little closer because even a fallen stone will cry out with testimony to its maker. As Jesus said, the very stones would cry out if we were not here to give glory to God. The word of God is inexhaustible and eternal. It has persisted through good days and bad. It rings out resurrection in time of pain and transition, and it hallows all things in time of peace and prosperity. Our little sector of the universe, human ingenuity serves the word of God, and we point to places like this one, which we call houses of worship, where it is possible to step in a little deeper each time and encounter God in a new way each time, be enriched by the mystery a little further each time. We make and we maintain these spaces because we believe they have inherent and holy worth because it is right and a good and joyful thing to offer them. We make and maintain churches like this one because we believe that such places can be crucibles and activators of our love of God.
and that we will be quickened when we are in them by being reminded how much God loves us joyfully, completely, freely. We make and maintain this space as a port of welcome for the weary and the curious. All of this is to say I am not troubled by Jesus' prediction that no stone of the temple would be left on another. Mark had current events in mind when he assessed the disaster in his immediate sights. And beyond that, I am spurred forward by my understanding of my life and my faith that every death results in a resurrection that finally nothing is ever lost in God's good time. So I go in fear and trembling to the last pages of the Bible. And there I find a vision of a city glorious and large, built square on strong foundations where the stones themselves ring out in praise and in the center of the city is a magnificent tree, the tree of life, it says, with its 12 kinds of fruit. The leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. I believe we can participate in this holy vision now. And so stones may fall, but it's only for a season. Fire may come, but eventually it exhausts itself and it runs out. Disaster leads to glory. Ruin leads to repair. The breach is overcome by love.